Our second guest is Mark Gagan. Mark directs the Center for E-Research at the University of Auckland. Hey, my friend. Mark, I want to thank you for introducing me to Jordana and to Bruce, which was the inspiration for this session. Look, thank you, and thanks for inviting me here. Thanks to Bruce, too. Great to meet you all. Kia ora from New Zealand. That's where I live these days. And um, yeah, thank you. Mark uh, is an old friend of mine who I had the pleasure of working with at Penn State University. Here's a picture of us at work together uh, about 10 years ago. Mark, you look the same age. I look so much older. <laughs> The idea of pairing Mark with Bruce is akin to what happens at the Center for, get this, the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. There, science fiction writers, scientists, and engineers team up to envision alternative worlds. Bruce and Mark are going to conduct our own little project hieroglyph right now. Bruce will read an excerpt from Junana, and then Mark will comment on the technical plausibility of the story Bruce tells. Okay, Bruce? All right. Hit it. Thais's mom had left before sunrise to work down at SeaTac Airport. Thaisha found a box of cereal, a bowl, and a banana on the kitchen table. She grabbed at the banana and headed for the sofa. And then she gobbled the fruit as she waited for the game to boot up on her laptop, an old Linux PC her mom had free cycled. Serena, Taisha's game guide, was dressed in her purple captain and a bright green head wrap. Serena offered a Junana greeting and said, you were introduced to simplicity in level two. Now you must unpack the entire pattern strand on your own. With no help, Taisha was new to level four. You want me to hold your hand, girl? I can always take you back to level three. Simplicity, Taisha spoke. We are doing simplicity today, no tricks. Taisha's screen faded, and then the familiar query UI appeared, the central video screen surrounded by sliders and buttons that allowed her to zoom through into or away from the montage of images, audio, and text the game tossed at her in response to her questions and commands. She adjusted her headphone and its microphone and settled into the sofa. Taisha spoke. Show me where I can find the capstone pattern for simplicity. Nice try, Serena said. You must locate this on your own. Take your time. It will not be obvious. Is it ever? Taisha took a deep in-breath. There was no slack in the game. Each query took all of her focus, every bit of concentrated thought she could manage. The screen filled with images, tangles of wires, neurons and ganglions, random piles of scrap, jumbled facades on a crowded street, urban transportation networks, complicated circuit diagrams. In Taisha's headset, a barrage of urban sound, roaring traffic, crowd noise, sibilant factory rhythms, nothing looked at all simple. And then her attention caught on something in a video scene of a crowded street. She jabbed the pause button, backed up the presentation in a few seconds, and selected an image of a single building. Show me this, she said. Well, whatever did you find, Serena asked. Right in the middle of everything, here's this building that seems to exist on its own, like a flower poking up through cement. There's nothing to it, just concrete and glass. Wow, who made this? The query offered information on Isasaki Arata, the architect, in a rotational image of the building's isometric form. A simple house, Taisha reflected, in the middle of such confusion, which only makes its simplicity somehow work, where it would be wasted on its own. I see a relationship between simplicity and complexity, some kind of necessary context, Taisha said. You are very close to the capstone pattern for simplicity. Serena encouraged her. Taisha contemplated. It's like a dance between them, or a game of hide-and-seek, or maybe a marriage. Excellent, said Serena. Simplicity loves complexity. Nothing is more boring than the simple without the complex. These are two sides of the same page. 
Over the next three hours, which passed like so many minutes, Taisha queried through all of the simplicity patterns, simple underneath, forced to define the simple building blocks that aggregate into complex forms. Standardized bricks, language phonemes, integrated circuits. Simple on the outside, taught her how much more she trusted simple interfaces, light switches, t-shirts, her game shoes. Simple saves time, told her to be direct and find the shortcut and the fun in efficiency. Simple anchors emotion, explore the emotional embrace humans make with the world around them and how simple acts of kindness give this balance. Simple choice starts it all. This is where simplicity sockets into the root Noel pattern. At the end, everyone must choose one. Well done, Taisha. Serena grinned and pumped her fist. I kicked it, yes. Taisha sat back and stretched out her arms. She reveled in the triumph, basking in, in the afterglow of new knowing. Pretty please, can I start on the kindness pattern now? Look out your window, girl. It's a lovely day. There's a book you put on hold, ready for you at the library. And you can walk it in less than an hour. And remember, you have an assignment to finish before Monday. Serena's clothing morphed into a high-waisted blue cotton gown with a simple white shawl over her shoulders. In preparation for Monday's history class with Ms. Gandhi, Taisha will spend hours in the game with Serena exploring life in the early 19th century in Pennsylvania. Taisha had chosen to inhabit a persona as a freeborn teenage girl of African-American ancestry who lived with her parents in Philadelphia in the year 1830. Each student in the class took the part of a different historical persona and argued their circumstances, their fears, and their hopes. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. And now, with Cesar's help, we're going to swap over to uh, Mark's laptop and invite him to share some thoughts about Bruce's reading. You know, all of us are in a battle for the attention of our students, all of us who work in a classroom. And um, many of us will know that we're losing that battle, battle for attention. We're losing it against games. We're losing it against digital media. There's a poster on the wall in my office. It's a quote from Albert Einstein, and it says, it is a miracle when curiosity survives a formal education. As humans, we take joy in the act of discovering something for ourselves and in demonstrating that we've mastered some new skill or understanding. It actually creates endorphins. That's part of the reason why so many video games are addictive. They tap into our curiosity, our need to explore for ourselves, and to figure things out. But as education has become more commoditized, particularly higher education, it's become more difficult to provide these moments of discovery these opportunities to wander through a universe of ideas following a specific thread. This is what universities and schools should be, places where we can be curious, where, can, where we can be guided on this journey. But in order to make an educational journey truly effective, we need two things. We need a guide and we need a path, as Bruce's reading showed. First, the idea of a guide, in this case, an AI guide. This, these are virtual humans. They are digital presence. They are digital intellect created by a company called Soul Machines. They're powered, as you can see there, by IBM Watson. They are AI beings. But more than that, not only can they speak to you, but they, they, they don't just hear you, they hear also your emotion, your level of engagement. 
And they see that too if you have a camera turned on you as well. So as well as being able to interact with you, they can read from you whether you're interested or bored or tired or confused or engaged. And they can adapt accordingly. Such guides are, being, are beginning to be used now in customer service and also, indeed, in medicine as a, as a kind of general practitioner to diagnose a disease. The second is the idea of a pathway. Now, if we take a, a student here learning Algebra 1, this is a system called Alex, which some of you may know, tries to help create academic pathways through a particular topic. Now, we're looking here at uh, a young kid and, and what they know and what they need to know in order to pass that algebra course. Thousands of topics that could be ordered in millions of ways. If we just take a handful of topics, even then, we still get a large number of ways we might move through this uh, space, depending on what it is the student knows when they begin and what it is they need to know. Not everyone starts at the same place. Not everyone takes the journey at the same rate. What we need is a learning system that can adapt to where a student begins, what their motivations are, and the rate at which they're comfortable learning. And in fact, that can be modeled now. Uh, as, you, as you know, as educators, it's quite easy to figure out where people are. If we know where, we, where they are in this space, then we can figure out the best way to move them forward based on what we know about that child's particular motivations or learning difficulties and challenges. Imagine now we could do this for a whole class in a whole universe of topics uh, cre creating a syllabus of education over a number of years. So we can create an optimal path for the learner through the subject, given what they know now, and what they're enthusiastic about, and what they need to learn from a curriculum point of view. And a guide can accompany the learner on the journey and adjust the plan based on their progress, their enthusiasm, and their capability, all gathered from the learner as the journey progresses. The result is an entirely personalized, interactive, and fun learning experience. Bruce. So, so hold on just a second. So Mark, you're saying in short that Everything Bruce described is plausible now? I believe so, yes. Plausible now. Hmm. Bruce, your next snippet describes the game from a teacher's perspective. The teacher's name is Emmy, Emma Gandhi, right? Yeah. All right. Emma Gandhi sent today's six student table leaders back to their tables with a short stack of questions. Questions that would stimulate initial conversations designed to arrive at a complex description of the contested territory created by the history of immigration into North America. Now, every table had five students, and over the weekend, each student in the class had used the game to immerse themselves into an historical persona. Together, these 30 personas spanned the continent and its history. Emma Gandhi herself had spent three years and a couple thousand hours of gameplay to get to level five, where she had full access to all of the game's many features. Over time, the game had demonstrated some core pedagogical qualities. The first quality was an absolute need for clear intention to power a true purpose in a student. And then the game added incremental skilling in a real-world knowledge-building system with individually personalized learning paths into this system, and finally, the availability of anytime learning through the game's interface on the web. The game was simple. With some initial guidance, you ask a question, and the game propels you through a problem space of that question until you get to a solution pattern and a list of other questions that might be of more value to you. And then you do this again, and each time you acquire a delicious morsel of new knowing, an opportunity to apply this bit of knowing to a specific problem immediately, and a dollop of endorphin when you do so. And that's why it's called a game. The game is also quite complex. It accessed and processed information from a repository filled with hundreds of petabytes of online content, 
including images, videos, and even data sets. The game assembled realistic 3D maps of most cities, some towns, and great stretches of natural geological formations from around the planet. These maps were underpinned with data layers for historic and contemporary analysis. You could query the maps to discover how a particular street or neighborhood came about and how it works today. The economies of its stores and businesses and the public utilities it requires to operate. You could also dial back into history and walk through the street as it was, say, in the late 19th century. Today, gamers could meet virtually almost anywhere and any win in the world. Emma figured that the best thing about the game is that it came from the outside, from the social fabric that her students wove in their own time and with their own initiative. Using the game flipped the classroom. This was now attached to a stream of ongoing learning happening elsewhere. Being able to use the game in school was like bringing in your own toys and showing off your own skills. Emma stood up. The room had grown noisy with talk. Make sure you capture the important perspectives on your post-its, she called out. Pin new questions on the wall for the next round. You have 40 minutes before we wrap up and change tables. She would drift among the students and take her own notes. Emma always learned something new. Who is teaching whom, she smiled. To be truly flexible and curiosity driven, the game needs to be able to draw upon a vast collection of organized geographical, historical, cultural, scientific, and engineering data. Key organizing elements for this journey are, of course, space, geography, and time, history. The raw materials here are resources such as Wikipedia, online museum collections, the story maps that Esri has facilitated and collects, architectural drawings, CAD designs, and so forth. The challenge here is to organize this content, to scrape it from the native applications, and to thread it together to make a worthwhile journey. Web semantics and strong persistent identifiers can help us link in appropriate digital resources. Here are some examples of things we might look at. This is a histography website showing 400 years of history organized as a timeline. You can stop anywhere, click, and up come some resources that you can choose to explore. You can look for yourself at videos and presentations to connect with here, the idea of radar. And when you're fed up with that, you can go somewhere else and look at how electricity was first developed and harnessed, uh, what happened in various conflicts and wars. It's all in here already. All we have to do is pull it out and thread it together. Here's another tool that I like very much. It's built by a friend of mine called Ben Adams. It's called Frankenplace. And what Ben did was scrape out all the temporal and geographical, all the historical and ge geographical place-based information from Wikipedia, and indexed all the articles in Wikipedia by their places and their times. And so here is an article about football. Now it's showing lots of hits in Europe, and that's soccer, mm -hmm. and lots of hits over in here in the, in the US, and that's what you call football. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, we, what Frankenplace has done is contextualize Wikipedia according to how, it's di how things are different and understood differently over place. Now we can type in anything we like. What would you like to hear? What would you like to have a look at? Maybe cheese. <laughs> and lo and behold, as you take a trip through Europe, you can look at the cheese geography of Europe. The cheese is on the right. Change as you move around. You could do the same with wine or beer. Any, any theme that's in Wikipedia at all, you can see down here. 
These are the places in France that make cheese. What if you could make geography and history real from a first-person perspective with great content, careful planning, and a personal guide to help you? Learning would become joyful, addictive, challenging, and personal. And here's my last little video clip. This is from Assassin's Creed, a video game which detracts many young people from their homework. But just recently, they, they launched a thing called Educational Mode in this game, which some of you may have come across, which allows you to take an educational journey rather than a journey murdering people across Europe. <laughs> and you can see that our little avatar there is following a path, uh, a learning pathway that takes them through all the great cities of the world. There are, I think, 40 or so of these journeys now that have been made by the creators of Assassin's Creed. And you can journey through Europe and Egypt and look at the history of civilization and the architecture and the geography and the technology. And you can learn all about it in the first person. You can literally walk it. Now, my old geography professor told me that geography was something you learned through the soles of your feet. You couldn't learn it without walking it for yourself. Well, here, you are virtually walking in places that you could never hope to visit, learning all about life in ancient civilizations. It is a phenomenal learning opportunity. And experiments have shown that it really does help certain categories of learners learn more quickly than if they were in a classroom struggling. So imagine mer merging the AI guides of soul machines with the Alex curriculum mapping, with the very best geographical, historical, and scientific resources that we as a civilization have produced, all available via a really killer first-person gaming engine that allows us to explore the world around us taking our own pathway on our own virtual feet at our own pace. We could build Junana now, I believe, if we put our minds to it. Awesome. OK, Bruce, you've got one more snippet about Robbie Robinson now. Robbie is the game's pedagogy expert. And in this snippet, he is addressing an audience at what was once Stanford University. Yeah, well, sometime in the past. <laughs> uh, so rejoice auditorium sat on what had been, until recently, a part of the campus of Leland Stanford Junior University. When the university was broken up into 10 residential colleges, and these, these colleges and all the old buildings were renamed using a random verb generator. The new names were designed to unhitch the colleges from the university's past to signal the advent of a new culture of learning and, some would venture, to piss off all the old wealthy donors <laughs> who had been sold on naming bits and parts of the Stanford campus. Rejoice Auditorium could hold nearly 1,000, and this evening it was filled to standing for today was the 10-year anniversary of the game. Robbie Robinson, the game's chief pedagogy expert, had been invited to talk about the impact the game had made on higher education and society. <clears throat> His current slide listed three major transformations or disruptions in the education enterprise. The first transformation happened in high school classrooms, he started, where students showed up prepared to learn and teach each other. Now, this alternately thrilled and terrorized their teachers, who quickly caught up on their own in the game and found that they had a lot more interesting things to teach than the content any gamer could query in a few minutes. At that point, the velocity of learning increased to where gamers were well into grad school material by the time they were 17. 
So the next disruption happened when these students hit university campuses. Before long, lectures were flipped, departments dissolved, tenure got killed when new bargains were struck to cover everybody teaching in the classroom. Most large schools split up into small colleges, the better to house intimate discussions that replace lectures. Layers of administration were axed in the process. Colleges discovered that their new value proposition required small conferences with a faculty of high-level gamers who held advanced academic badges. And where there were no physical colleges to attend, in many parts of the globe, several hundred million students got the equivalent of a college degree directly through the game. The third transformation was the consolidation of open academic research into a global web of interoperating repositories, platforms, and distributed data networks. Libraries canceled ruinous subscription agreements and spent their budget to sock it into open resources and provide filters and discovery tools. New research could now be located precisely where it fits with, it fit with existing knowledge. Robbie took a long breath and glanced across the auditorium. And guess what? Science finally figured out what science knows. Of course, he cued his last slide. A gaggle of female teens dressed in jeans and tops on a dirt track in a northern Laotian mountain village. And they all wore gamer hats and mugged for the camera, but their grins were genuine. Of course, he said, education was the launching pad. Around the planet, we're seeing transformative experiments in society, the economy, and government. When the game was still just an idea, Michael O'Hara challenged his designers to make gamers smarter. But Michael was simply restating the goal educators have held high for centuries, that their students will have better access to information, will strive for more knowledge, and become more capable of guiding their own generation to lead a society that is fully prepared for self-governance and personal growth. Robbie walked to the front of the stage, his hands held wide. He used his teacher's voice to address the crowd. If you're looking for heroes in this endeavor, you need to look in the mirror. Each one of you can take what you've discovered through the game and beyond and build a new world. Transformation is just another word until you plant its seed in your lives and the lives of those around you. Thank you. So, Mark and Bruce, you may not know it, but there's a lot of educators in this room and quite a few parents as well. And I imagine that some of them might be concerned uh, about the possibility that a story like Junana could actually play out in their children's lifetimes. So what do you have to say about the implications of Junana for educators and parents, Mark? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, imagine for a moment, those of you who are in the classroom or have children, that your children or your students were as dedicated to their studies as they are dedicated to their gaming. I was having a conversation with my son, who's in his 20s, about Florence and the great houses of Italy. And it became really clear to me after two or three minutes that my son knew a lot more than I did about this. And once he figured that out, he rubbed it in. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is, I have been to Florence three times and taken educational tours of the city and navigated its streets. My son has played Assassin's Creed. <laughs> He's never been to Italy. He learned its history, its geography, and its, and its technology from a game. And he didn't even know he had done that. He was busy killing people. <laughs> <laughs> but on the way, he got better educated than his dad. Fantastic. Fantastic indeed. Bruce. Well, one of the things that we can look at is what Clay Shirky calls um, 
it's the cognitive surplus that's available today, but being wasted or not used in any way. And we're talking billions of hours, hundreds of billions of hours that are, are, we're spending uh, in our lives collectively that could be put into other purposes, social purposes, uh, and of course into learning. Uh, and learning in ways that are connected and not learning inside a game architecture. The Theory of Fun and Games is a book that came out about 15 years ago. And the theory says that the most fun you can have in a game is learning something new and applying it right away. And that's what fun is. Solving puzzles, figuring out dilemmas, getting your mind active in a way that, uh, uh, that results in new knowledge and new knowing. And uh, one of the things that happens in the game books after the first book is that people get up and get into conversations. So conversation is really where you, you share this knowing. Um, and so the game enabled them, and the, the, the patterns, what I call templates in the game, enabled them to have extremely useful knowing conversations, and that's, that's where it is. And you bring those into the classroom, and suddenly everyone's teaching everyone else. Before we conclude, I want everybody to know that Bruce and Mark will appear at our Education Summit reception, which starts this evening at 5 p.m. The first 100 guests at Bruce's table will receive a free copy, printed copy, of the first volume of the Junana Trilogy. So, I thank you all again sincerely for joining us here in San Diego. Special thanks to Angela Lee, who orchestrates this incredible conference, to my successor, Jerry Miller, and to speakers Dawn Wright and Helen Thompson, who prepared so well for this event. Thank you so much. And most of all, Most of all, I want to thank Bruce Caron and Mark Gagan for their truly inspiring stories about how digital transformation in education really can change the world. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.